I'd like to, the first place that I ran across him was when I heard that he had published something from the Joint Economic Committee, and I got a copy from the Hoover Institution, which was the unexpurgated version that took out all the, that included all the controversial things that the JEC gutted. And I was intrigued by his thesis, namely that minority youth unemployment was largely a function of governmental impediments to uh, free labor markets. And I contacted him to speak at an uh, interns program that I was running at the time on the economics of conscription and the so-called poverty draft. Namely, it was an opportunity to speak on why minority youth suffer such high rates of unemployment. Since then, I've followed his work and read just about everything he's published in journals all over. And they're always very insightful, very interesting, and quite iconoclastic. Finally, they were put together in a book. And I was very happy to read that recently and find that it was not simply the insights that I had found other places, but all kinds of new ones that were very thought-provoking. The thing that struck me the most was that unlike most books on a subject of this sort, this one is characterized by a passion for the truth and a real attempt to find out why it is that certain people do better than others or worse than others, not simply a polemic or a um, attempt to convince, but also an attempt to find out why. And the honesty of Dr. Williams' scholarship is a, a very refreshing um, breeze in a town that's full of all sorts of advocacy and special interest pleading. I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Walter Williams. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to try to quickly, in the space of about 20 minutes, highlight uh, some of the things that I think um, are important in the state against blacks. <coughs> uh, <coughs> some of the things that I will say will break with conventional wisdom on the subject. And matter of fact, some of the things I might say uh, might appear to be downright sinful and so to the extent that that might be true, uh, you should feel free to raise any kind of question that you wish, uh, and you need not feel as though you owe me any undue uh, courtesy. Uh, you can get as emotional as you please or, or as searching as you please, at the same time keeping in mind that I have a, a black belt in karate, should you <laughs> think about physical things. Um, essentially, the working hypothesis of the book is that contrary to conventional wisdom, racial discrimination alone is an inadequate explanation of black problems, of problems that black people face. Uh, attempting, as many people uh, uh, see it, uh, well, excuse me, as, uh, attempting to explain the problems that blacks face by saying that it's due to racial discrimination is somewhat like trying to uh, explain fires. That is, if you ask me what was the cause of the Grand Hotel fire in Las Vegas uh, a few years ago, and if I were to respond, well, it was caused by oxygen, uh, you would be a little bit upset. And, uh, uh, but however, while you're upset, I could say to you, well, had there not been oxygen, there would not have been a fire. Uh, but however, trying to explain the Grand Hotel fire by such a, uh, a hypothesis uh, does not explain why the Washington Hilton did not also burn down because it too was surrounded by oxygen. So what I'm saying is that, that uh, oxygen is so pervasive that you cannot explain anything with it. Now so is discrimination of all sorts. It's so pervasive that you cannot explain anything uh, with it. Uh, and if you don't believe me, that is so pervasive. Uh, for example, when I was choosing a wife to marry, and probably you did the same thing, uh, I did not give every woman an equal opportunity. I systematically discriminated against white women, Chinese women, fat women, women who did not bathe regularly, and so forth and so on. <laughs> we, we discriminate in all kinds of activities. 
We discriminate in all... So, discrimination is pervasive. Uh, and you'll note that uh, people even discriminate with respect to size, uh, height, you know. There are not too many presidents in the United States uh, that weren't, were not tall. Uh, short people just don't make presidents. Neither do they make generals or executives. So, so I'm saying, what I'm saying is that discrimination uh, is pervasive. And so it, it alone cannot explain too much. But beside that, uh, uh, it's attempting to explain outcomes on what people like and dislike is just very, very unsatisfactory. You cannot explain human behavior on the basis of what people would want to do. You cannot explain it at all. That is, if I made, for example, a survey across the United States and I asked people, which do they like the most? Uh, uh, Rolls Royces or Pintos? Most people would say they like Rolls Royces the most. Uh, which do you like, fine jewelry or costume jewelry? Most people would say they like uh, fine jewelry. Which do you prefer? Uh, uh, Lafitte Rothschild Bordeaux wine or Annie Greenspring's wine? People would say, well, Lafitte Rothschild. But however, if you watch people's behavior after having made such a survey and watch what they actually do, you see that uh, Pintos outsell Rolls Royces, costume jewelry outsells fine jewelry, and Annie Greensprings outsells uh, Lafitte Rothschild hands down. So when you attempt to explain human behavior, you cannot only look at what they would like to do, but you have to look at what they can do. And that which determines what they can do uh, happens to be income and prices. So we have to pay more attention to those kind of restraints. But, but let me get back to the notion of discrimination and explaining anything. Now, if discrimination, if racial discrimination could explain things, uh, well, how come the Chinese, for example, in Southeast Asia, the Chinese are discriminated against, uh, uh, against minority in Southeast Asia in most places. They are relatively tiny parts of the population. But in some countries, uh, the Chinese control uh, up to 60% of the GNP, even though they face massive, uh, 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 they face massacres over the years and expulsions and things like that. Or Indians in Africa. That is, Indians face discrimination in Africa, but yet Indians uh, tend to have the higher incomes in, in uh, many African countries. Or Armenians in the post-Ottoman Empire. The Turks tried to exterminate them, but however, the, uh, the standard of living for Armenians or income for Armenians tends to be higher than the rest of the population. And of course, it's the case of Jews historically have faced discrimination, and Jews in those countries uh, have higher income very often than the people who discriminate against them. Or if we go to America, uh, uh, Jews have been discriminated against in America, but they have very high incomes. Or Japanese, according to the recent census, the most recent census, Japanese have the highest per capita income in the United States, even though they face gross discrimination, particularly in the late 1800s, and they're eventually in turn. Or Poles or, or Jews, let's say West Indian blacks. In the United States, second generation West Indian blacks, they have a higher median income than most whites. So what I'm saying is that the evidence, if you look around the world, the evidence does not support the widely held belief that racial discrimination can explain as much as people attempt to uh, say it explains. Now, uh, looking through the issue of race, uh, I believe that there's a lot of confusion that I talk about in Chapter 2. There's a lot of confusion and misunderstanding because of the terminology that we use when we talk about race. Uh, that is, words shift meanings. Uh, uh, that is, words shift in their meaning. Uh, for example, if I were to ask anybody in Washington area, even a person like Benjamin Hooks or Vernon Jordan or, or Fauntroy, and I ask them, have the water fountains at the D.C. National Airport, have they been desegregated? Now, the average American would say, yes, of course they're desegregated. What would, the test, uh, what would be the test that they would use to determine whether the water fountains have been desegregated? Well, they just ask, well, if a black is at a water fountain at the airport, can he in fact take a drink? And if so, uh, there, the water fountains uh, are uh, desegregated. But when it comes to schools, segregation has a different meaning. That is, you ask the average person, are schools in the United States uh, segregated or not? And there'd be a lot of controversy over it. That is, uh, many people would say yes, and many people would say no. And the test that many people would use, they'd ask, well, what percentage of the population at school consists of blacks? 
and if blacks were less than some preconceived notion of what the right population uh, should be, then they would conclude that school was segregated. <laughs> now, nobody would use that same test when I asked them the question about water fountains. Nobody would say, and when I asked them, well, are the water fountains at D.C. National Airport uh, uh, segregated or desegregated, uh, nobody would say, well, black population is 70% of Washington or 70% of the people drinking at every day at the water fountains, are they black? And if not so, the uh, water fountains are uh, segregated. Okay, in addition to not using that kind of test, uh, nobody, I believe, would suggest in the interest of social justice that we bust blacks from Anacostia to the D.C. water fountains <laughs> and bust whites over to the uh, water fountains in Anacostia in the name of uh, social justice. So what I'm saying is that these words are used very sloppily and people just don't, and, and they shift meanings across uh, different subjects. I, I also talk about in this chapter on uh, uh, confusing uh, terminology, I talk about words such as discrimination. What is discrimination? What's a good operational definition for discrimination? Well, I say, well, discrimination is solely the act of choice. That is, uh, uh, scarcely requires that we choose. And so we all discriminate. We must discriminate. It's a fact of life. There's another word that uh, uh, people use. They use prejudice. And sometimes they confuse, the, they use the word to, uh, prejudice as, uh, uh, in a confusing fashion, and they're really talking about discrimination. Now, prejudice to me, I think that prejudice is a very, very good word if we stick with this Latin derivative. And prejudice, and it just means to prejudge. Or an economist can best understand the word prejudice or the concept prejudice to be uh, making decisions on the basis of incomplete information, the utilization of stereotypes. Now, making decisions on the basis of, in, of incomplete information is a necessary part of life. Why? Because information is scarce, and people always seek ways to economize on information costs. So the employment of, of stereotypes is a useful part of people's behavior. Now, some of you might say, well, what's this guy talking about? You, you might say to yourself, well, look, I'm not prejudiced. Well, ask yourself the following question. Suppose after the lecture today, or the talk today, uh, as you're leaving the room, as you turn the corner, there was a full-grown tiger standing there. What would you do? Well, I would predict, or uninteresting prediction, is that most people would endeavor to leave the area in great dispatch. <laughs> That's uninteresting. Okay, but it becomes a little more interesting if you ask yourself, if you ask yourself, well, why do you run? or seek safety. Is your decision to run based on any detailed information that you have about that particular tiger? Or is your decision based on tiger folklore, what your friends have told you about tigers, how you've seen <laughs> other tigers behave? It's probably the latter. That is, you stereotype that tiger. You say, all I need to know is that's a tiger. <laughs> and I'll make my decision accordingly. And that's a prejudice, that's a prejudice type decision. You're stereotyping. Now, of course, if you were, if you were not prejudiced, what you would do is go up to the tiger and try to gather more information. <laughs> Before you made the decision, you would attempt to pat him on his head to see whether he is friendly or et cetera, et cetera. And only if he behaved in a menacing fashion would you then run. <laughs> but most people, they say, when they see the tiger, they say that they predict that the expected cost of an additional unit of information about that tiger <laughs> exceeds the expected benefit. And whenever that's true, people don't search anymore. Now, now I, I talk about some other things in that chapter, but let's go uh, to some use of this terminology to apply it to uh, uh, everyday life. Now, the fact that we recognize that people seek to economize on information costs can perhaps explain various forms of human behavior, such as redlining in certain neighborhoods. That is, banks say at the current rate of interest, or at, let's say the mandated rate of interest, they say, well, we have to engage in credit screening. And so they may indeed use race or sex as a proxy for credit worthiness. That is, their discriminating with respect to race and sex may not have anything to do with whether they like or dislike 
the person involved, but they're using race, sex, and geographical location as a proxy for probability of, uh, of default. Uh, but however, we misunderstand that banker's behavior if we assume that because uh, he may not lend the blacks or he may charge some higher interest rates, uh, we misunderstand that behavior uh, if we assume that the behavior is motivated by his racial tastes and or sexual tastes. The same thing happens to do, uh, 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 the same principle can apply to hiring. That is, some schools, no, excuse me, Im imagine a company that's going to hire kids graduating from high school to train them in, let's say, on-job training in physics or something like that, and they're looking for a kid who might score, who hasn't taken the test, but he might score, uh, say, 700 on an SAT score, on an SAT test. So if he has to pay $1,000 per prospective candidate that he interviews, well then why should he go to, let's say, an all-black school? where the probability of finding a successful candidate is very, very low. And so what he's doing when he does not send his recruiters to such a school, he's behaving as a Bayesian. He's looking at probabilities, and he's made some associations, and he's basing his behavior on that. So what I'm arguing here is that there are many forms of human behavior uh, uh, that can be accounted for by by this notion or this cleaner notion of prejudice behavior. That is, many forms of human behavior represent economizing on information costs, and you misunderstand that behavior if you just assume that uh, uh, it's taste and distaste. Okay, now, so if prejudice and all these other things that people talk about, or, or excuse me, if, if racial discrimination per se dislikes and likes things like that, if that doesn't explain the problems that blacks face, what does? Well, I'm arguing that the problems that blacks, and, and I might uh, interject at this point, that the problems that blacks face are human problems. It's just the fact that they affect blacks and whites as well, but it's just that blacks bear a disproportionate burden of uh, some of those problems. But I argue that the problems that blacks face are a result of the rules of the game. That is, we need to pay less attention to what we call racial discrimination and more attention to the rules of the game. It is because the rules of the game are very, very important in determining the outcome of the game. That is, if you can write the rules of the game, you can determine who wins the game, so to speak. Now, let me give you an example of how important the rules of the game are to who wins the game or the distribution of the winners. And I've been criticized for this example, but since I have, since I have such a rich physical endowment, I just keep on giving the example anyway. Uh, if I were, uh, if probably, if you went around the world, you could not find five females that could beat the Los Angeles Lakers in playing basketball. That is probably a correct assertion. Now, the question comes up, why? Well, some of you would say, well, it's because men are taller than women, men have more upper body strength than women, men can jump higher than women, men can run faster than women, men can run backwards faster than women, so forth and so on. Well, if you gave those kind of answers, you'd be all wrong. It has to do with the rules of the game. It has to do with basketball law. And you'd see this if you say, well, Williams, we appoint you as commissioner of basketball, and we give you full power to write basketball law. And we want you to rig the game so that women would win all the time. It'd be very easy. I make a new law. The game had to be played in high heel shoes. <laughs> or, or you had to knit a tiny doily before you go on a fast break, or something like that. And you just see Jabbar with his big hands trying to get uh, a tiny doily together. Oh, <laughs> well, that's a simple-minded example, but the point I'm trying to make is that if I can change the rules of the game, basketball law, I can change the composition of the winners. Now, there are numerous laws uh, in the United States that uh, rig the game, the economic game, against certain people based on their characteristics. And one that I've done a lot of research on has to do with the minimum wage law. The minimum wage law tends to discriminate against low-skilled worker, workers. In general, these rules that rig the game against less preferred people, less preferred based on some uh, 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 based on their uh, non-pecuniary attributes, and pecuniary attributes, I might add, the common feature of these laws is that they reduce options for people engaged in voluntary exchange. That is, the common feature of all the laws that rig the game, it reduces people's abilities to engage in voluntary exchange. And the minimum wage law is one of those. And for, just briefly, because most of you understand the minimum wage law, but 
the effect of the minimum wage law is that it mandates that the uh, minimum hourly pay that you can give a worker is uh, $3.35 an hour plus some mandated fringes, uh, Social Security and unemployment compensation, all that kind of stuff. And so it tends to discriminate against any worker who cannot produce that quantity. That is a worker who's so unfortunate to only be able to produce $2 an hour, he just is, uh, he faces unemployment. Uh, now, most people who fit in that category are teenagers. Teenagers in general, they, they're low skilled. And black teenagers, uh, they're even more low skilled than white teenagers because they get uh, a fraudulent education delivered to them by the government schools and maybe there's some other socioeconomic characteristics that play a role in there. So you say, well, what's evidence of that? Of the, what's, what, what, what kind of empirical data can we t uh, get to tend to confirm that hypothesis? We just look at unemployment statistics. Black teenage unemployment is around 50%. White teenage unemployment is 22, 24%. Now, uh, while most Americans are aware of the high rate of unemployment among uh, black teenagers today relative to white teenagers, uh, they, are, they are not so aware that back in yesteryear, black teenage unemployment was less than uh, white teenage unemployment. In 1948, uh, at least, <coughs> it was e either equal to or less across all age groups. And back in 1948, uh, black teenage unemployment was uh, uh, for 16 year olds was less than white teenage unemployment and their labor force participation rate in every group was higher uh, so how do you account for that can you say that companies have become more racially discriminatory since 1948 I doubt whether that can explain it can you explain it by the economic cycle no because black teenage unemployment rose relative to white teenage unemployment even the best of times uh, um, you, can't, you can't say that uh, blacks were more educated than whites in 1948. The evidence, the economic evidence, uh, suggests that uh, um, increases in the level of the minimum wage law and increases in the extent of coverage of the minimum wage law accounts for a large percentage of this increase in unemployment. Now, in addition to creating unemployment uh, for black teenagers, the minimum wage law encourages racial discrimination or all kinds of discrimination, I should say. That is, if you must pay two workers who may be equal in their productivity the same wage, well, you might as well, well, what's the economic basis for choosing among workers? You have to pay them both $3.35 an hour. So you hire the workers that you like the most. And so it lowers the cost of discrimination. That is, the minimum wage law, uh, in the case of two workers having equal productivity and you must pay them $3.35 an hour both, uh, it makes the cost of discrimination equal to zero. Matter of fact, the minimum wage law and equal pay for equal work laws, which have the same kind of effects as the minimum wage law, uh, they're so effective at, uh, at encouraging discrimination uh, that South Africa, the white racist unions in South Africa are the major supporters for uh, the minimum wage laws and equal pay for equal work laws for blacks. Uh, I found this out while I was there. Uh, I, was, I spent two months in South Africa lecturing at virtually every university there. And uh, we didn't have any, my wife and family and I, we didn't have any problems because we had diplomatic immunity, uh, <laughs> which means that we were honorary white people for two months. <laughs> and, and so, but however, I did find out that the labor unions are the major supporters for minimum wage laws and for blacks. And their stated reason is to protect high-skilled white workers from low-skilled, low-wage black workers. Of course, we have more noble stated intentions behind our support for minimum wage law in the United States, but in both places, even though the intentions differ, the effects are the same. That is, it creates unemployment for the least skilled worker. Um, going on, another chapter of the book, um, I talk about occupational and business licensing. And uh, uh, one of the most dramatic uh, forms of licensing is, uh, is licensing of taxis. Um, what does it take to be, able to, own, to be an owner operator of a taxi? Well, it doesn't take a college education. You need a high school. You, you don't even need a high school graduation, you know, elementary school, whatever. And how much capital do you need? Capital do you need? Well, it's very little, you know, enough for a used car, a thousand dollars, something like that. And so I say, well, how come it's not an area for many people to get a little bit of upward mobility? Well, it turns out in New York, for example, 
uh, you need to go out and buy a license that, uh, that has been as high as $65,000 for each one taxi that you own. In Philadelphia, it's 20000 down from $33,000, uh, Boston around 40000 and uh, um, Miami around 35000 Now, what's the effect of a law that would generate this kind of license price? Well, it tends to, a $60,000 license tends to discriminate against anybody getting into the cab business who doesn't have $65,000. These people tend to be poor. Poor people tend not to have that price. So it would discriminate against poor people getting the cab business. Now, now Washington, D.C., or excuse me, in Philadelphia, uh, it's pretty hard to get racial data on the composition of the cab industry. In New York, for example, the Human Relations Department doesn't, uh, it's, uh, they ban that kind of information. But uh, talking to Wilson Good, who's the ex-PUC chairman of, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Pennsylvania, he told me that uh, no more than 2% of the taxis in Philadelphia are owned by blacks, even though Philadelphia is a city whose black population is around 50%. But, but, but if you go to Washington, D.C., you'll see that about 70 to 80% of the taxis are owned by blacks. And why I say 70, 80 percent, such a, a large margin for error is because my research assistant and I went to the taxi cab uh, or the limousine commission, and we determined race of the owners of taxis by looking at the pictures on the ID cards, and, and some of the guys were kind of funny. Uh, <laughs> we, we couldn't tell whether they were white or black, so we, we stuck with the number that we were sure of. Now, you cannot explain the ownership in, of taxis in Washington by saying, well, there's no racial discrimination in, I, in Washington, uh, D.C., and there's racial discrimination everywhere else. It turns out in Washington, D.C., that you can get license, licenses to own and operate your uh, taxi for fees less than, that total less than $200. And $200 differs significantly from $65,000. Um, <clears> so, but however, there are multiple set of beneficiaries from this open, relatively open market in Washington because consumers get a better deal because taxi prices are lower here and then also uh, the taxi services is, is of a higher quality if you measure quality and number of taxis per 1,000 population in Washington is 12.1 taxis per 1,000 population New York is 2.4 and other cities uh, around that are less um, now there are other forms of licensing that exclude people for example in Miami, I was attending a, a, a conference on Liberty City riots, and I just inadvertently found out that pool cleaners are licensed in Miami. Uh, and I was asked this uh, this lady who she was on the council down there. I said, "Well, how come pool cleaners uh, pool cleaners are licensed?" Well, they said, "Well, you know, it's a public health type issue because if pools aren't clean, you know, there might be typhoid, developing plagues, and stuff like this." <laughs> and so I asked her. I said, "Are people uh, are legally allowed to clean their own pool?" Uh, and so she said, yes. Yeah. So I said, well, if you're concerned about public safety, uh, people should not be uh, a clean, allowed to clean their own pool unless they were licensed. And so I said, well, who's supporting this kind of stuff anyway? She said, well, it's the Pool Cleaners Association. <laughs> and, and so, and it turns out that in order to get a license to clean a pool, you have to go to pool cleaning school in, uh, in Miami for, I believe, a year or so and learn chemistry, diatomaceous soil, and all that kind of stuff. And they're, they're roughly, I could go on and on, but they're roughly 3,000 different licensing jurisdictions in the United States that license things from landscapers, pig feeders, auctioneer, junk people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the effect of the licensing is to raise the cost of entry, and the incumbents wish to do this. If they raise the cost of entry, they can restrict entry and charge higher prices to us all. Uh, included in this regulation is the uh, the ICC and the Inter Interstate Commerce Commission, which is the lobby for the truckers and the Teamsters. They restrict entry. They act on behalf of uh, big trucking companies and the Teamsters, and they make it very, very difficult for people to enter the market, the PUC on the state level. But let me just point out uh, one of the problems in regulation, in the ICC regulation, that suggests uh, that we have, uh, we don't approach these problems correctly. For example, I came across a black trucker 
uh, in my research on ICC regulation, a black trucker named Ward Smith. He was in uh, Omaha, Nebraska. He bid the lowest bid on to ship the household effects of uh, Air Force personnel at Offutt Air Force Base. He was not awarded the contract because he did not have broad enough ICC authority to ship uh, goods across state lines. Ultimately, the contract was awarded to another trucker who bid $80,000 higher than Ward Smith. Well, so on the first approximation, you and I lost as taxpayers, and Ward Smith lost. Now, many people, seeing that blacks don't have many go uh, uh, government contracts, they argue and they propose affirmative action, or actually more correctly stated, quota programs for blacks. Now, Ward Smith did not need a quota program. He needed government off his back. For, uh, because he did not need any help at all. But, but the quota programs don't deal with the government erected collusion for the Teamsters and the trucking industry. Furthermore, there are many white truckers who, they can't, who can't get broad ICC authority either. And so what does it do for racial relations for a white trucker who only differs from Ward Smith by color to see Ward Smith get a, uh, a, uh, a contract and they uh, not get one. That is, it gets two people fighting one another when the true villain of the piece is the United States government. Now I'm going to wind up in a minute because uh, I'm sure you have some questions, but one of the things I want to make sure, very, very clear, is that these regulations or these restrictions on markets aren't necessarily racial. That is, uh, while I was doing some of the research on taxis, I used to, whenever I got in a taxi, I would strike up a conversation with a driver try to get some gossip type information. And so anyway, I landed at D.C. National Airport one time, and the black driver picked me up, cab, cab driver picked me up, and I said to him, I said, to you guys in Washington very lucky, uh, because uh, almost anybody can get in, you don't have to go out and buy a $65,000 medallion in order to own and operate a taxi. So the driver said to me, he said, well, we've been trying to get a medallion here, but the uh, Congress won't go along with it. He says, as it is, with these, uh, uh, with the, these cheap license prices, we got these damn West Indians coming in, the Pakistanis, the Arabs, and everything like this. So the point for you to keep in mind is that it's not necessarily a racial thing. It's the ins versus the outs, and the outs want to keep the outs out so that they can charge uh, higher prices. Uh, let me just spend two minutes talking about one other thing, because, it's, uh, uh, because if you don't buy the book, I encourage you to buy the book and give it to all your friends. Um, but if I don't tell you this, you'll never know. Um, income differences. A lot of people argue that income differences suggest racial discrimination. Well, it's not very clear that it does. Uh, you know, you heard the frequently made statement that uh, since 1960, black median income is 58% of whites. And then people go on to say that, well, as proof of racial discrimination, that we haven't done anything to solve the problems of racial, race in the United States, even when blacks graduate from college, black males when they graduate from college only make 72, 74 percent of what white males uh, make who are college graduates. Well, I came across that figure, and so I said, well, let me, before I do a little study, do some statistics on it, let me see about black and white females. And when I started going over the data for black and white females, I discovered the best-kept secret of all times. It even exceeds the secrecy that surrounded the Manhattan Project in World War II. <laughs> and that is, black female college graduates, their income, their median income, is 125% of white females. And I looked at it and I said, could it be that white men and black women have some kind of conspiracy going against <laughs> black men and white women. So, not being uh, taught to subscribe to conspiracy doctrines, I did some rank order, it's a rank order correlation test. Uh, uh, it's kind of a statistical test where you compare distributions. And to make a long story short, <clears throat> I found out that there are over 26 different occupations, occupational categories for professionals and college graduates, black and white females, are virtually identically distrib distributed across the uh, occupations. That is, the most important category for women, both black and white females, black and white women, are, is non-university teachers. That is, 44% of college graduates, female college graduates, are non-university teachers, and, and roughly the same uh, across race. 
the second important category was uh, nurses, and black and white females are roughly the same proportion of nurses. Now, switching over to males, black and white males, the most important occupational category for black males was non-university teachers. I believe it's something like 29%. Uh, and I believe white men were something like 16%. But the most important, largest category for white men was engineers. Something like 21% of, uh, of white male professionals were engineers, and something like 5% of black male professionals were engineers. Which suggests, if you look at the median income differences between non-university teachers and engineers, engineers, uh, uh, the year I took the, uh, uh, did the test, engineers were making 14,000 and non-university teachers were making slightly less than 8,000. So looking at the distribution, even if everybody were paid the same wage for every job, black and white males would earn different income or lower median income than white males. But you might say, well, I, and I didn't explain why um, uh, black females earn more than white females. Now before you rush out to say that as a result of affirmative action, uh, keep in mind that in 1960, black females who are college graduates, they earned 102% of white females. And in 1950, they earned 99%. So you can't, you can't attribute it to the affirmative action. What I believe it is, is the fact that blacks are more urbanized than are whites. And it turns out that teachers who work in urban centers receive much higher pay than teachers in rural centers or suburban areas. And nurses who work in, in urban centers earn more than nurses who work in rural centers. Back in Philadelphia at school, I used to teach at Temple University, they used to pay uh, nurses hazardous duty pay to work in Philadelphia. <laughs> okay, so what's the policy recommendation for all this? Well, I suggest that a courageous president, as I wanted uh, President Reagan to be, and as he turned out uh, uh, to be less than that, I believe, he would have the Justice Department of the United States bring antitrust suits against these localities that uh, have state-erected monopolies. But however, there's a problem with the Parker Doctrine. The Supreme Court said in the Parker case in the early 40s that states are immune from antitrust laws. So we'd have to do something about the Parker Doctrine. Um, I, there's also uh, tools at the hand of the FTC to press uh, for prosecution against uh, uh, anti uh, anti monopoly uh, or antitrust um, uh, to take antitrust cases. I believe more importantly than that kind of solution, I believe that we need to view the problems of blacks as human problems, because a sixty-five thousand dollar license discriminates against a person of any color getting in the cab business. So it's a human problem. It's just that blacks came to the cities late, you know, after the licenses were, uh, uh, laws were enacted. That's why there's a dis differential impact on them. But I believe that if we view these problems as human problems, a better or more viable political coalition can be a form. And then finally, in kind of summary sense, I propose lawlessness uh, as a policy recommendation. That is, in New York, um, there are 11,787 legal cabs operating along the street, but they have a gypsy industry there. And the estimates on the gypsy industry is that there are five to 14,000 taxis operating as gypsies. So what a lot of people have said in New York is that we're going to go out and earn an honest, albeit illegal living. And I advocate that more people do that kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> And I advocate that people illegally operate buses and illegally operate trucks across the highway, earn an honest but an illegal living, which is quite consistent with our founding fathers because a lot of our founding fathers were smugglers and gun runners and people <laughs> like that who wanted to earn an honest living. Well, look, that's all I have to, the time to say. There's many more things I could say, but you feel free to raise any kind of question or make any kind of comment that you wish in the question and answer. Thanks. Is there um, any uh, particular type of, uh, of racial discrimination that still uh, should be dealt with in the laws? For instance, uh, uh, should uh, a law be allowed on the books that would uh, uh, enable country clubs, let's say, to, uh, uh, or schools not to uh, uh, just give blacks the membership? Is there any, anything at all 
you feel that uh, black can have or Chinese or Japanese, whatever, can have in the way of uh, protecting against racial discrimination? Well, uh, well, first of all, let me say, let me preface my answer briefly with the following: that um, one's commitment to, let's say, free speech uh, is not tested when he allows people to be free to say those things that he thinks that they should say. It, it's tested when he permits people to say those things that he finds abhorrent. The same thing with freedom of action. One's commitment to freedom of action uh, comes when you allow people to be free to do those things, those, vo those voluntary things that, with which you disagree. Uh, so I, I wouldn't have any laws preventing people from discriminating. Now, I should say that in government activity, say, if, I, if I'm uh, taxed to support a library through a tax system, well, then I think that that library should not have the right to deny me entrance. Uh, but however, if it's a private club, private school, et cetera, et cetera, I think that uh, they have a right to uh, have members come in based on any criteria that they choose. Well, let me provide a follow-up on that. Then. Let's say with a, a privately owned bus line that pays taxes to travel over a uh, public highway, uh, should they be allowed to require blacks to uh, ride the bus the road? No, I'd say that it's fine. I mean, the point is, is that because people are free to discriminate uh, doesn't necessarily mean that they will. That is, when we did have this, that kind of uh, public accommodation discrimination in the United States, there were laws requiring people to discriminate. Now, if you see a law requiring people to discriminate, then you must guess that had there not been for the law, people might have acted, behaved differently. Because you must ask yourself, if all white people could be trusted not to sell their property to blacks, why did we ever need a restrictive covenant laws? Evidently, there are some white people that just would not go along with the uh, gentleman's agreement. It would just fall down. So, um, so th there's, there's some problems that I have in, in uh, resolving the public accommodation issue, but in general, facing the problem that you just asked, you know, like clubs, private schools, I think people have the right to discriminate. You know, I. I testified in the House Judiciary Committee, and I, uh, my statement was that uh, to them was that in a free and democratic society, people have the right to hate whomever they please for whatever reason they please, just like they have the right to love whomever they please for whatever reason they please, but they do not have the right, I believe, to interfere uh, with one another through uh, involuntary exchange. And matter of fact, uh, Congressman Drynham, uh, he's a, a priest uh, on the, uh, there, he has other problems as well. But he said, Williams, uh, could you explain yourself? I don't understand. I said, look, I live in an all-white, high-income neighborhood in the mainline suburbs of Philadelphia, and I think my neighbors have the right to get me out of the neighborhood if they want to. Uh, and so he says, well, what do you mean? I said, I think they have the right to come around and offer me $800,000 for my house. <laughs> and, and I will call beacons that night, and their neighborhood will be restored. But I was pointing out that most people, when they want to get me out of the neighborhood, they'll find that $800,000 is too expensive, so they want to make, use ink, make a law. And furthermore, if one of the neighbors came around and do it, it, it just would not be viable if they did it, because I know my neighbor next door, he's a white guy, nice guy, uh, he would, what he would do, he would go to downtown Philadelphia and find a black guy and say, look, why don't you give me $400,000 of the house? These people are going to come around and offer $800,000. We're going to put the difference. <laughs> so I'm just saying the competitive pressures of the market would just break down, that kind of rule. <laughs> There's a question back there, and then you. Somebody had a hand up back there. Uh, uh, that's all there. Yeah, uh, and then you. I was looking for a brief amplification of the argument you used about, uh, about minimum wage laws. You said the same kind of argument can be used for equal pay for equal work. Yeah. Did you sketch that argument out uh, reasonably later? Okay, well, well let, me, let me just use, use an, an example. Um, if, if I must pay all the productive inputs that I use in a job, labor or whatever, if I must pay them equally, then if, and if they're all equal in their productivity, then if there's a person over here that I prefer less, the cost of my discriminating against them is effectively zero. Uh, that is, 
uh, equal pay for equal work laws discriminate against workers who are perceived as inferior. They just don't have a chance to offer a compensating difference. I mean, it, it, think about it in this sense, that suppose we had an equal steak law, uh, and, you know, uh, you know, Chuck Steak had to sell, in the interest of social justice, Chuck Steak had to sell for the same price as Philly Mignon. Okay, what would you do when you went to the store? What do you expect to see on the shelf every time you went to the store? Chuck Steak. Because people, the, the people would discriminate in favor of the Philly Mignon, and Chuck Steak would be unemployed. Now, a lot of people, a lot of concerned people, they, they find offensive the fact that some people, in order to sell what they have, their labor services, they have to take a lower price than somebody else. And some people similarly find that for some people to buy something, they have to pay a higher price than somebody else. Now, and so they might find it morally repulsive, but, you know, economic theory does not say what's fair and what's morally repulsive and things like this, but economic theory can predict what will happen if you don't allow some people to pay a higher price for what they buy or charge a lower price for what they sell. And let me give this example because I think it's very, very important. Is that Suppose I ask the crowd here, the group of you here, the following question. Suppose you see a fat, old, ugly, cigar-smoking man married to a beautiful young lady. What kind of prediction would you make about that man's income? <laughs> <laughs> you would guess that it's pretty high. And so what is the guy doing? He's saying to the beautiful young lady that, well, look, I can't compete for your hand on the basis of a guy like Williams. So I'm going, to, <laughs> he says, so I'm going to offset my disadvantages by offering you a higher standard of living. Now, some of you who are concerned people, you might say, well, is it fair for beautiful young ladies to jack these guys up, to make them pay high prices? And so you might conclude, well, no, it's not fair. So you want to make a law saying that, Beautiful young ladies can't treat uh, fat, old, ugly, cigar-smoking men any differently than they treat handsome men. Okay? And then after that law is passed, then ask yourself, what then happens to the probability of a fat, old, ugly, cigar-smoking man marrying a beautiful young lady? You make an equal sex law, whatever, then the probability, I mean, that is, you deny him the only effective way of competing with more uh, uh, preferable men. Right? Yeah. Your, then you. your answer on the discrimination on the bus, uh, I'm wondering if it really would, would hold up in the present situation where most bus lines are state-branded monopolies. Wouldn't that be true? Would no. Would it have to be in a system where you didn't have to buy a license or where, where, where you weren't the only bus line, in other words? Yeah, I would agree with you, yes. Okay. No. I want to follow up on I just said, point. the earlier distinction between the right of private institutions to discriminate as opposed to public institutions. The kind of public distinction breaks down, or the law has moved for some time for breaking it down. I wonder if you would elaborate a little bit along the kinds of lines that were just mentioned, where you've got some public utilities, such as bus lines, trains, and so forth, which may be nominally private by a certain yeah. public purposes, like public accommodation. And more uh, importantly, in recent uh, litigation, uh, private institutions that are receiving public funds and therefore take on a certain public toleration and that being a lever used to deny them the private right of discrimination. You, you know I have mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, that, that's a problem. That is, my solution, my proposed solution, now you might say, well, what would I do now? My proposed solution is to eliminate the, uh, all these public places and let people privately engage in whatever they want to do. Now, when, when it becomes more public, then it does make the issue a little more complex than I originally stated. Uh, I'm, I'm, not very, I'm not sure. But I'm saying that the general uh, uh, premise that I'm, or, the, or my general values, because I can't prove it one way or the other, uh, my values are that people in their conduct of their private lives they have the right to discriminate on the basis of whatever. So what we should do, I believe the policy recommendation, is to make sure people have a greater percentage of their lives that are private. Now, that's an unsatisfactory answer, I know, but uh, that's the best way I can answer. Yeah. Um, I very much understand your question, your statement about the taxes. If you raise the price of entering the market, you're effectively discriminating against the 
And you go on to cite the fact that there are 3,000 such licensing agencies in this country. And one interesting uh, example you might like to add to your repertoire is Lee uh, Benham points out that the cost of becoming an ophthalmologist now in terms of time is about 12,000 times larger than it was around the turn of the century. So effectively, poor people not become ophthalmologists. But I would ask you, is there not some function for licensing uh, along the lines of the discrimination question had earlier? And it seems to me that I, I can perhaps anticipate part of your question is, which is that people will recognize quality, and quality costs a certain amount, there will be a market. But I think that in the 1950s, we saw that there was very much a market for abortion when it was illegal, and we had some very negative uh, outcomes say that for a very low price, a woman could be guaranteed of an abortion, but she couldn't be certain that her life would continue long, that it would be a very high cost on her life expectancy. So uh, my question is then, what role does licensing play? Well, the, the abortion example is just like uh, prohibition. You know, people got a lot of bad whiskey during prohibition days. Uh, and uh, so when something is uh, made illegal, we don't have the kind of market forces that generate information about quality. Now, in general, what I think needs to be, I, let me, let me clearly make, make my case uh, uh, state out clearly first. I think that, there, that information about quality is very, very important. It's socially valuable. But the question to ask is, what is the most efficient way to generate this information about quality? It is not clear that licensing is the most efficient way. Now, perhaps uh, uh, certification might be a better way. Certification differs from licensing, and that is uh, licensing, if you don't have a license, you're not allowed to uh, practice. Uh, certification means that, well, uh, you can practice, it's like CPAs, uh, you can practice, but you have not uh, uh, taken uh, some kind of uh, examination, uh, you haven't received the good housekeeping seal or whatever like that. Now, I'm not all that convinced, even in the most extreme case of licensing, that the licensing of doctors even uh, accomplishes its desirable or its intended uh, goal. Uh, uh, if you ask the AMA, you know, they will admit any day that something like 13 to 15 percent of all doctors should not be in hospitals because they're either drug, drug addicts, uh, incompetent, or alcoholics. And after, if you don't believe me, after the conference is over, you can call your local AMA and ask them for the names and addresses of these doctors so that you can avoid them. And uh, I doubt whether such information will be forthcoming, which does not seem in the uh, public interest that the AMA uh, 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 uses that kind of demagoguery to support the stuff. So the question is, I think that the market, if permitted, can generate information on uh, quality. And I believe it can generate perhaps more reliable information on quality. And then furthermore, low quality goods are part of the optimal stock of goods in our society. The existence of low quality things make us, makes us better off than otherwise would be the case. I mean, how would you like them to make a law saying in the interest of high quality uh, cars, we're going to make all other cars except Mer Mercedes illegal? Well, I'm quite sure most of us would be worse off. That is, the existence of lower quality cars uh, uh, makes us uh, better off.